So as good as crizotinib is, there are many drugs in development. There's over half a dozen other drugs that are in development to target this same pathway. And we refer to these as second and even third generation drugs, although those terms are somewhat made up by the timing of when they were developed. Um, the two biggest examples of, uh, of agents that have been on the scene in the recent years uh, and, and where the most of the discussion continues to be around is a medication called seritinib and a medication called electinib. So these are considered next generation agents that uh, are in, in laboratory models definitely more potent than crizotinib in inhibiting ALK um, and also appear to cross the blood-brain barrier. So they appear to have a better ability to get into the brain and hopefully either prevent or treat uh, known metastases. These agents have been proven to be uh, um, effective, highly effective agents. And what the big question is right now is, are they better than chemotherapy? And we can talk about that, that here shortly. And are they better than crizotinib? That, that's ultimately the big question. Crizotinib was on the scene first, a great drug. You have next generation drugs, which also are fantastic by themselves and patients who have ALK rearrangements. Are they good enough to replace crizotinib? And that's kind of where we're at now and what we've learned at this meeting uh, in Vienna. Uh, generally, crizotinib is quite well tolerated However, there's a few toxicity that sometimes can prevent the patient from continuation of it. Approximately 4% of the patient may have significant hepatic toxicity, meaning the liver enzyme can go up and sometimes can be quite quick and quite severe. So this type of patient, then certainly we cannot continue with the same medication. And also there are very small percentage, less than 1% of the patient may have something called interstitial lung disease, which can present like limonitis. And again, those are the type of patient who become intolerant to chrysotinib, but both the hepatic toxicity and the pulmonary toxicity are relatively uncommon. So chrysotinib um, is a multi-targeted uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It inhibits a number of different targets, um, but uh, actually remarkably it's quite well tolerated, so the toxicity overall is very mild, and that's really held up across all of the studies of chrysotinib from phase one to phase three. The major side effects of crizotinib um, include visual disturbance uh, and GI side effects. Um, visual disturbance is seen in up to 80% or so of crizotinib treated patients. It tends to be mild, typically what we would call grade one. And it's pretty characteristic in patients where they describe that this visual disturbance is triggered by moving from dark to light. So that there's a, uh, it triggers some type of ad ad adaptation um, when the light is turned on, and they describe findings such as um, visual trails or sometimes scattered lights. Typically, it's quite transient, maybe lasts 30 seconds to a few minutes. Um, and again, it really is triggered in that particular situation. The other common side effects are GI, including nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea or constipation. I would say these are generally quite mild and easily managed with um, medications, anti-nausea medications or anti-diarrheal medicines. There can also be some hepatotoxicity. We see uh, elevated liver function tests um, in a, a minority of patients, but these do require monitoring every two weeks for the first eight weeks of crizotinib treatment. Um, and then finally, the last common side effect we see is peripheral edema. Um, this typically occurs after a few months of treatment and can be cumulative where it worsens over um, months to years of treatment and often will require some type of management including conservative measures like compression stockings and leg elevation but sometimes also diuretic therapy. Patients do generally very well on crizotinib, um, patients with either ALK or ROS1 uh, rearranged lung cancer. However, almost all patients will relapse on crizotinib. For ALK patients, it's often within the first year. For ROS1 patients, often within the first couple years. Um, and resistance is due to um, the cancers uh, developing often secondary um, mutations and other alterations that now make the cancers no longer respond to crizotinib, and this is what we call acquired resistance. 
Uh, over the years, a number of groups have studied mechanisms of crizotinib resistance. Uh, and I would say overall, we typically classify them as either alterations of ALK itself, including mutations within the ALK tyrosine kinase domain or amplification of the ALK fusion gene, or the other large class of resistance mechanisms has to do with um, what we call off-target mechanisms, meaning that the cancer cells have activated other pathways besides ALK. Now, interestingly, it turns out that in patients who have failed crizotinib, most of them remain very sensitive to more potent ALK inhibition. So in fact, they're still ALK dependent. Um, and so that was somewhat of a surprising finding to us to realize that when a patient fails crizotinib, and this is in the particular setting of ALK rearranged lung cancer, most of those patients will go on to respond to a more potent second generation ALK inhibitor like ceritinib or electinib. So in fact, even though we've defined these different on-target and off-target mechanisms of resistance, at the end of the day, most patients do respond to more potent ALK inhibitors.